Hello everyone. Welcome. I, thought, I know you just sat down to start eating, but I thought in the interest of time we would get things uh, started. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, as you know, this was initially scheduled for a month ago and the weather got in the way, but I looked at this um, somewhat symbolically. I was driving to the hotel tonight and it was the most beautiful sunset that I've seen in a long time and I'm thinking spring's coming so we have to keep that attitude uh, before us. Um, I wanted to make sure at the beginning that I thank Kathy Schandelmeyer and Doreen Karen for um, all their hard work. Um, as you all know there is CME available for this um, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the turnout tonight. Um, we have an interesting agenda. Um, we had to change it a little bit compared to a month ago. Um, I still hope um, over the next few months to get Carmine Fumietto to give a presentation about uh, lung cancer screening with CT scanning. I think it's a very interesting topic with some controversy and I think it certainly uh, has a lot of pertinence to primary care providers. Uh, as we do, oh, as we do traditionally, I want to introduce uh, new providers. Some are here, some are not. Many of you know James Ostrander, who was um, in our residency program, I don't want to say many years ago, but several years ago. Um, he's at Minot Avenue and Mechanic Falls. Uh, Elena Bell Wagner, Brunswick Primary Care and Bridgeton Pediatrics. Is she here? Hi, thank you. Elena, <laughs> Jolene Stevens, Elsmore Dixfield Family Medicine. Ann Johnson, Elsmore Dixfield Family Medicine. Jennifer Sullivan, Naples Family Medicine. <laughs> Tiffany Charlson, uh, Vascular Medicine. Hi. Kate uh, Ridlinski, Lisbon Family Practice. Uh, the next two uh, individuals um, I'll editorialize a little bit. Um, Lynn Dumont and Stacy Legassi. They are um, the two nurse practitioners in the medication management clinic, our new Kumanin clinic or uh, Warfarin clinic, and you'll be hearing more about that soon. Stacy also works uh, with Chris Short in Mechanic Falls. Katarina Funk, High Street Family Medicine. Taylor Butterfield, High Street Family Medicine. And I see Ed Wagner over there. Hi, Ed. High Street Family Medicine. I also want to acknowledge uh, the residents who are here. We very much appreciate uh, your attendance and Hope you'll be in the community attending this function for the next 10 or 20 years. There you go. I think the next person I want to introduce um, will be um, someone familiar to you all. I don't want to inter uh, interfere with Bill's supper, but um, uh, Bill will uh, maybe come up here and introduce his new associate. Bill Phillips, who, by the way, will be retiring this summer. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. I've decided to call it a sabbatical. Uh, actually, I didn't. I thought you were going to introduce it. Also, um, but I, I'm happy to do That's so. That's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> so I, basically, I would uh, thank you all for inviting us, uh, since we're not primary care doctors, secondary care doctors. Sort of a, another tier now, but uh, I uh, I'm very happy with the way things are are progressing with CMHBI, and we have some exciting new people that have come on uh, both in surgery and in cardiology, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that Dr. Andy Eisenhower has been uh, appointed hired as our director of CMHBI, I call him our super chief. I forget what his middle name is, but his initials are A ACE, A-C-E. So uh, um, Andy has been uh, a, a 
preeminent interventional cardiologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston for, for many years. I have this recollection that it was 18 years. Am I right about that? 15. 15 years, okay. But when you get to be as old as you are, it's, it's true. I, I, I am older than Andy, even though he looks older than I am. <laughs> It's not the years, it's the miles. I want to say that um, I know some people that had worked with Andy, and when, when I found out that Andy was potentially going to be interviewing up here, I called uh, a person that I've known for many, many years, a uh, uh, very, very uh, well-respected and well-known uh, interventional cardiologist. It happened to be a guy by the name of Jeff Hoffman that I've known for, for many years. And, uh, and I wanted to find out about this guy as to whether or not he was any good, <laughs> and whether he got along with people, and all those sorts of things that we find important in medicine. And Jeff said, you can't find a better colleague than Andy Eisenhower. And, uh, and believe me, that was a, a tremendous uh, recommendation from somebody that I've known and respected you know, since I really began my uh, career in cardiology. Uh, so I'm really delighted that Andy has uh, made a decision to come and uh, join us here at CMHBI, and I think that the future of CMHBI is looking brighter than ever. And I'm, I'm very proud myself that we have been able to create a program where we can attract people like, like Andy and Carmine Fermiento and Paul Weldner. And I think you're going to be seeing even some other uh, interesting people coming to CMHBI. I think uh, we have uh, established an elective physiology program with Dr. Mohanty over there. Stand up, Dr. Mohanty. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Sora. And you know, we've had, we've had some growing pains along the way, but uh, it's really exciting to me to see how, how things are going. And uh, so when I start my sabbatical <laughs> in July, I feel like uh, I'm, uh, leaving CMHBI with a, a great staff of people to carry on. So, this is the end. All right. Gee, that's, my mother would have loved that. <laughs> I'm going to try to switch microphones. Can I do that? which, uh, as you might imagine, is like herding cats. But 
I maintain my staff privileges to bring them uh, to this day in my Harvard appointment, but I'm not a mouse doctor. So I've been a practicing physician for 30 years, and I think I understand the needs of practicing physicians in all subspecialties and across the board. What's my job here? Well, I'm supposed to direct, coordinate, and improve care in the cardiovascular arena, and that is to coordinate vascular surgery, cardiac surgery, and cardiology, and keep us all in the same sandbox playing together, working for the benefit of you and your patients. And then to leverage and promote the unique strengths of CMHVI and CMMC. Now, people have lost it, often ask me in the past few months, what, what did you, why did you come up here? And one of the reasons that I came, among the many, is that we don't have a system where we're encumbered by the traditional structure of the Department of Medicine, Department of Surgery, and you're in your guild and I'm in my guild. We really are together and really focused on the patient and patient care. It's not always perfect, but the model is there, which is very different from any other institution in the Northeast. It's really an institute in reality, not one in name only. Everybody has an institute. We actually have a group of practitioners that are dedicated to the patient. So I hope to advance the capabilities of the Central Maine Healthcare family, particularly in the interest of patient care in high technology cardiac care. So for example, let's think about structural heart disease. We all know about percutaneous coronary intervention, coronary angioplasty, coronary stenting, treatment of patients with acute MI, but interventional cardiovascular medicine and surgery is so much larger. We have structural heart disease, atrial defect closure, perivalvular leak closure for patients who have had past cardiac surgery, pulmonic valve replacement for the catheter, occlusive venous disease and pulmonary embolus, which is a really untapped uh, need uh, in our communities, left atrial appendage uh, occlusion to prevent stroke and atrial fibrillation, mitral valve technologies, which are coming down the pipe and are available now. But I want to think about, for, for just a minute, the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. It's kind of the most prominent area in structural heart disease intervention today, an area where minimally invasive techniques are really pushing the envelope away from cardiac surgery. So the transcatheter aortic valve replacement is simply an aortic valve that's collapsed on a catheter that we use to replace the dysfunctional aortic valve in patients that are reasonably high risk for surgery. And it's FDA approved for patients who are inoperable or at unacceptable risk for surgery, or patients that are at high risk for surgery, those with a risk of about 8% or greater. Why is this important to you in general as primary care practitioners are taking care of patients who are older sometimes. There are about a million and a half people in the United States that have aortic stenosis. And around 10% of everybody over 65, particularly men, have aortic stenosis. So if you think about it, it's somewhere between 7 and 10% of the people over 65 that you see in the office every day will end up having or aortic stenosis. Why is that important? If we look across the board in the United States, these patients are going under treatment. At least 40% of patients who are eligible for aortic valve replacement are never considered for that. Why? Too old, too frail, the diagnosis not recognized, it's misinterpreted as, well, it's just slowing down, it's normal aging, it's something, you know, mom or dad or whatever it is doesn't particularly want to think about it treating this condition, but it's underappreciated. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be treated, but everybody needs to be followed. Why is this important? Even if you have no symptoms, you've got about a 50% three-year survival free of operation with severe aortic stenosis. So patients may be asymptomatic, but they also may have a condition that really is potentially fatal. Why is this such a difficulty? One of the reasons because aortic stenosis develops over decades. Patients have a systolic murmur. They are relatively asymptomatic. They can be followed clinically or with imaging for many, many years. And then seemingly, all of a sudden, they go downhill. And sometimes at that point, people say, oh, mom or dad is too sick to do anything about. When in fact, all of this was predictable. 
survival after the onset of symptoms is about 50% in two years. So this is the equivalent of heart cancer, right? It's worse than breast cancer or even worse than lung cancer. Surgical intervention for severe aerosinosis is the gold standard and ought to be done when it's recognized. But many of these people, particularly in the United States today, having lived longer, have multiple comorbidities and may not be good candidates for surgical intervention. So surgical aortic valve replacement is the gold standard, but why might you not do it? Well, it's not good for everybody. Here's a patient. This is the first patient who had transcatheter aortic valve replacement of the 94 years old. Yeah, 94 is probably ready for the bone yard. This guy was the contract bridge champion of the United States. He played with kids in high school and college and beat them uniformly. So he was absolutely sharp as a sharp as attack, but he had passed cardiac surgery and had coronary grafts that made him held in hostage for a repeat cardiac operation. And he was deemed inoperable. So he was a reasonable candidate, perfectly good substrate, reasonable candidate for aggressive therapy. Younger patient, age 77, he had a porcelain aorta. So for him to be operated on, it would have had aortic, aortic <coughs> excuse me, arch replacement, a horrendously difficult operation, and he was at very high risk for stroke. So he was deemed inoperable or high risk. And finally, a very common scenario, particularly today with survival, breast cancer, and Hodgkin's disease, and other lymphomas, here's a person that had, had chest wall irradiation and had a history of breast cancer and had terrible chest hostility and was not a candidate for aortic valve replacement. So here were three patients, a variety of, of medical conditions, who were not good candidates for aortic valve replacement, all who had transcatheter valves. Why is this important? We in interventional cardiology sometimes get pushed back as just wanting to do procedures, just wanting to find patients who need a PCI before they die, or need an aortic valve replacement before they die, or need something done before they die so we can just do procedures. In fact, that's not my perspective. If you look at patients with inoperable aortic stenosis, who've gotten transcatheter valve replacement versus those who've been treated conservatively and medically, the results are dramatic. In this instance, in the partner trial, which is the first randomized trial of aortic valve replacement transcatheter technique, at a year, half the patients who were followed medically were dead. Only 30% of the patients who were treated with transcatheter valve replacement were dead. At two years, even more dramatic, 68 versus 43. But more important, the number needed to treat to prevent one death for one year is five patients here. Great, fantastic therapies have no number needed to treat of 15, 20, maybe 30. Dramatic difference. And what was the median age of this population? About 80. So octogenarians are not people who are disposable. They're very, very important patients to treat under these circumstances. So aortic stenosis needs to be recognized and needs to be treated. <coughs> These are some patients who were deemed inoperable who had transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Here, there's, this gentleman was bedridden beforehand. Here's a picture that he sent us a month after his hospital discharge. This gentleman was a D-Day veteran of World War II, couldn't get out of bed, had transcatheter valve replacement. He saw it 12 hours later. This man was on the board of the hospital had a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. He had a hostile chest and couldn't have surgery. And next year, he was snowmobiling in Iceland. And so we have these things over and over and over again, of patients who were deemed inoperable, not candidates for standard therapy, but who were benefited by transcatheter valve replacement. Why am I up here talking about this, about, you know, aren't we great? No. It's because there's an opportunity in every patient in every disease where therapy is possible, and after that opportunity is lost, therapy can be dangerous. So we know in patients with aortic stenosis, I showed you this before, where there's a downturn when patients have <coughs> symptoms. When they get to here, they can have surgical valve replacement and be better. And they can continue to do this along the line. After surgery becomes prohibitively dangerous, transcatheter valve replacement can be used. But at some time, 
it's not possible to do anything, and if you do something, you'll actually kill people. And the important aspect, the interface between what I do and what you do is to figure out where this spot is. Because we want to treat people here that we can benefit, and we don't want to treat people here that we're going to harm. And this is one of the hot topics of research in transcatheter valve replacement. I call these patients the disoperable. The patients in whom you do something, you'll actually hurt them. And here's a man who was 86 when I saw him, who had aortic stenosis for a decade before this. He was followed with serial echocardiograms, and by the, by the time he became truly symptomatic, he was deemed inoperable and wasn't treated. By the time he came to us, he had so many secondary effects of the aortic stenosis that, in fact, he was disoperable. Had we done anything to him, we would have shortened his life and made him more uncomfortable. So I'm not standing here to say, yep, every patient, every time, under every circumstance, we can fix them. But with your help, we can get to patients early and we can fix them. Take home message before I start is there's a much new and innovative we can do for structural heart disease, venous disease, coronary disease, peripheral arterial disease, arrhythmias and heart failure, some stuff that's not even known. The take home message is call me or my colleagues if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have a need of just a question about if there's something to do for this, that, or the other thing. We're available and we welcome that. My reason here is to help you help your patients. And if I can do that by the time I get to Bill's age and ready for the boneyard, I'll really have done, I think, something that'll make me happy. So thanks very much.